All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to tonight's uh, webinar. It's misdiagnosis or malfeasance, fact or fiction. Dr. Joe Saka is going to be doing this presentation for us tonight, and I'll be moderating and hosting. Dr. Joe Saka is an attending optometric physician at the Center for Sight in Sarasota, Florida, which is a large medical surgical practice where he focuses on glaucoma management and neuroophthalmic disease. Joe is a resident. Joe is the residency education coordinator for Center for Sight and the director of optometric business development for USI. Joe was formerly professor of optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years, where he served as chief of the advanced care service, director of glaucoma service, and the program coordinator and supervisor for the ocular disease residency. Dr. Saka is a founding member of both the Optometric Glaucoma Society and Optometric Retina Society. He is also the founder and former chair of the Neuro-Ophthalmic Disorders and Optometry Special Interest Group for the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Saka is a glaucoma diplomate of the American Academy of Optometry, and in 2021 and 2022, he was ranked number four optometrist in the United States by U.S. By in the U.S. by the Newsweek magazine, America's Best Eye Doctors list. Joe is a colleague, friend, partner, co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. Joe, please listen closely because I hear it. The audience is giving you a big round of applause uh, for this synchronous virtual program. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Greg. I, I saw a number of names come in. A number of my former students uh, are attending this meeting, so that's terrific. Uh, welcome, everybody. Tonight, misdiagnosis or malfeasance, fact or fiction. Uh, I'm going to keep this pretty, pretty conversational. These are general hours for everybody. Uh, my disclosures, I've got several disclosures. Uh, I have been on the advisory board or speaker bureau for Bowers and Lowe, but uh, all relevant relationships have been mitigated. Along with Greg, I am co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. And I have one more disclosure that I usually don't do. Uh, nothing that I'm going to state during this lecture should remotely be construed as actually being fair. But you probably understand that in a little bit. Now, I want to start off with our general hours of common preventable causes of catastrophic patient injury that we have to be aware of. There are a lot of things that I see that have led to uh, misdiagnosis and catastrophic uh, patient outcomes. Uh, giant cell arteritis, this is such a very disease, there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, in fact, uh, I was not, for those of you who were here last week, last Tuesday, I was not because I was, not, I was traveling out of town because I had to uh, testify at a malpractice uh, trial involving bilateral blindness from giant cell arteritis. Posterior vitreal detachment and retinal detachment. Now, just because a patient develops a retinal detachment doesn't mean the optometrist should be sued, but they will be. Infectious keratitis, you know, that comes from the failure to ask, what else can't it be? I know we treat a lot of bacteria, we have to also consider fungal infections and protozoan infections and viral infections. And it's very tough sometimes to balance the time needed with, 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 with keratitis, you know, for the treatment to take effect versus just going too doggone long. Optic atrophy is a term that I think is used a little too cavalierly, which uh, ends often badly. And don't forget the eye not correctable to 2020. If it should be 2020, we need to investigate it. And when patients have unexplained symptoms, I think it behooves us to run it down. I can tell you if there's a symptom or complaint in the history that is not addressed and something goes, uh, goes awry, you've got some explaining to do. Start off, 74-year-old male presents with the worst headache of his life, goes to a Veterans Administration a hospital, and over the course of about three weeks, he sees a physician assistant, an emergency department physician, a cardiology fellow, a nurse practitioner, and three optometrists. This all occurs over multiple visits in a three-week period. 
Now, when looking at his history, he complains of eye ache, jaw pain, scalp pain, facial pain, somnolence to the point where he'd fall asleep while eating his food, malaise and jaw caud caudication. On the very first uh, visit, he was examined by a PA. The PA diagnosed temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, even though he could fully open his mouth. The, uh, the supervising physician either uh, didn't, do, uh, didn't examine the patient or cursorily examined the patient, but agreed with this uh, diagnosis, TMJ causing the worst headache of his life, and prescribed NSAIDs. Now, a patient comes back for follow-up and, you know, not feeling any better. Now they find a tick on him, and he is in a Lyme endemic area, so he's diagnosed with Lyme disease and put on doxycycline. And over the course of his visits, specifically, it was written, vasculitis such as temporal artery is highly unlikely, not GCA, but a said rate C reactive protein were ordered, they were elevated, but there's no indication that anybody ever saw them or acted upon them. Ultimately, an optometrist finally made the diagnosis, but it was too late, his end result, bilateral blindness. 72-year-old female presents six-week history of scalp pain, fatigue, weight loss, transient vision loss, or transient ischemic attack in the right eye. Goes to an optometrist with sudden vision loss in the right eye. Findings, no light perception, right eye, 20-20, left eye. Diagnosis, papilledema of the right eye. Plan, refer to ophthalmology the next day. Goes to an ophthalmologist the next day, is now bilaterally blind from a bilateral arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. 68-year-old female, one-month history of sore throat, cough, ear pain, all unresponsive to antibiotics. Suddenly loses vision in the right eye. Go, is seen by a neurologist who diagnoses Horner syndrome correctly, but it doesn't explain the vision loss. Sends the patient to ophthalmology who diagnoses central retinal artery occlusion and there's no workup done. So you've had a you've had a stroke in the eye. There's nothing we can do. A month later, patient has sudden vision loss in their other eye. Now, when doing a, a proper history. Find out the patient's not eating for six weeks prior to initial visit due to pain while chewing. No light perception in the left eye, ischemic neuropathy, pupil involved third nerve palsy, ocular hypotony. And of course, the other eye has uh, Horner syndrome and an artery occlusion still. Said rate is markedly elevated at 114. There is a positive temporal artery biopsy. Patient is put on high dose steroids, felt better almost immediately, but had no visual recovery. 78-year-old female, one-week history of acceptable jaw pain. Family practitioner treats the patient with, with an NSAID. Two days later, patient has one hour of total vision loss in both eyes. Right eye comes back, left eye doesn't. Family practitioner hears this, immediately discontinues the NSAIDs, refers to ophthalmology, uh, ophthalmology triage, said, I think it's an NSAID reaction. Wait a week for them to wear off before you come in. Unfortunately, the patient couldn't wait. Next day is no light perception in the other eye with a said rate of 117. And that's what we have to be careful of, that kind of uh, misdiagnosis or malfeasance uh, when we deal with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. This is a, a hypoperfusion of the, of the posterior ciliary circulation. Now, the ciliary arteries, it can be arteritic or it can be non-arteritic. Now, the non-arteritic version, we have atherosclerotic features uh, that contribute to uh, this condition, uh, while an autoimmune vasculitis is going to contribute to the arteritic form. Typically, it's a unilateral pre uh, presentation, but a high incidence of subsequent contralateral involvement with ischemic neuropathy. Now, we take a look at the optic nerves. They do have a distinct, different appearance. Arteritic ischemic neuropathy tends to be a very pale, swollen optic nerve, whereas the non-arteritic version tends to be a more hyperemic swollen nerve because of dilata dilatation of the telangiectatic vessels on the surface of the optic nerve, trying to reperfuse that optic disc from one occluded area to another. 
Whereas an arteritic ischemic neuropathy, you know, there's no blood getting to any surface capillaries. With the non arteritic version, we have the risk factors of, of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and small crowded optic nerves. Now, keep in mind a small crowded optic nerve is not protective against arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Six to one, they're going to have an inferior field defect, and the inferior field defect usually is an inferior arcuate defect, not an altitudinal defect, and as it described, it's a hyperemic swollen nerve. The other eye is going to have a disc at risk with a small, you know, pretty much non-existent cup, and this is, uh, you know, this is a younger disease. The youngest I've ever encountered this was the late 30s, uh, early 40s, and all the way up to death, but it is painless. It's very, very important. It's not a painful disease. Arteritic ischemic neuropathy is that pale swollen optic nerve, and there may be some other fundal findings such as cotton wool spotting out there. There's pain of some sort, usually jaw pain, head pain, neck pain, girdle pain, shoulder pain, uh, but you can have patients who are asymptomatic. Usually it's very severe optic nerve dysfunction, usually more severe than non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy, but they do have very similar visual field defects. Obviously, giant arteritis of polymyalgia rheumatica are risk, risk factors. Typically in the 70s, uncommon under 60, but it does happen. Any literature you look at, this will be described as, and always remember this, uh, an inflammatory disorder occurring in patients age 50 or above. So once you have the age of 50 on a patient, this is always on the menu. Then there's a high risk of bilateral involvement. The reason this ends up in misdiagnosis and malfeasance is the fact that patients, you know, they're diagnosed when the fellow eye goes blind and they can no longer be helped. And risk of bilateral involvement, 65% at about 10 days average. So when these patients come in with vision loss, the clock has already started and it's ticking against you. So making a diagnosis, you got you to ask about the non-visual symptoms. And I always leave it open-ended at the end. And headache, 90% of patients, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, but it's not pain while chewing. It's they get tired, like they're eating a dry steak. Uh, ear pain, a thrombus, temple pain, uh, or temporal tenderness, malaise, intermittent fever, night sweats. Now, I'm specifically going to ask these, and then I'm going to ask, is there anything that has changed that I should be aware of? Anything at all physically? And in that situation, it probably falls under the, 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 cat, the, the realm of giant cell arteritis because it is a multi-symptom, multi-system disorder affecting any medium and large arteries. Now, of course, we're going to do an examination. Keep in mind, they can have a disease and still have a normal exam. Uh, lab study, SED rate, C-reactive protein, platelet count is what we're going, to, we're going to be ordering. Now, SED rate can be lowered by statins and NSAIDs. C-reactive protein will not be affected by NSAIDs. Platelet count is actually very important. You know, platelet count for in 400,000 is not necessarily diagnostic, but it's more helpful than an elevated SED rate for diagnosing giant cell. Also, a normal platelet count is more accurate in ruling out giant cell than a normal SED rate. So always remember to keep that 400,000. 400, now, what do you do when things are, are kind of borderline? Well, you know, the, your serology. Well, fortunately, most cases aren't borderline. You know, when I encounter when I encounter patients suspected temporal arteritis, in the last two weeks I've had I've had two you know, two people who were sent in uh, rule out temporal arteritis. Most cases aren't borderline. Usually the serology is very normal, or it's very elevated or very abnormal. Now what if, you know what if cases are borderline? Well, last week I had a patient who's a longtime headache sufferer. She's of the right age. You know, she has new headache. It's constant headache. Not a lot of other, uh, other findings. The exam was, was normal. 
Well, I'm absolutely going to order the tests. It's very easy to do. We can get them the same day. Her said rate came back as two. Her platelets were under 400 or 100, 400,000. And uh, I told her, so look, you know, CRP is not back yet, but it's going to come back normal, so don't worry about it. And, and about a day later, it came back, and it was elevated. You know, eight's normal, and she comes back as 8.75. Well, when I write down, rule out temporal arteritis, what are we going to do? When in doubt, rule it out. And I actually sent her out for a temporal artery ultrasound, and I just got that back that it was done yesterday. got the results yesterday, called her today, and said it's all normal. So when in doubt, rule it out. Go all hey, the way. Hey, Joe, can you take a little deeper dive into that? I mean, in the, you know, it used to be biopsy, now ultrasounds. Mm -hmm. Is you want to, you know, I've heard you talk about it before, but maybe not a, a lot of our audience might not be familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, temporal artery ultrasound sort of is the way to go about it. And there, there are certain techniques and skills that I don't have and, and, and really can't well explain. But there is a vascular surgeon in my area in, in Sarasota who's extremely uh, easy to work with. Uh, I can if I if I if I need a, uh, an ultrasound, I can get the patient in generally the same day. It is not as complicated as getting a, a biopsy. It is not as messy as a biopsy. When you think you're cutting a person's scalp open, and he, he, you know, people tend to, tend to be a little bit hesitant to do that. Well, this is very non-invasive and very easy. It's not going to it's not going to hurt the patient. So that's kind of what where we're going. And in Europe, they don't really do uh, biopsies any longer. They do all ultrasounds. Yeah. So I guess, you know, the key points there would be that it's non-invasive. And then when you do the biopsy, we always heard about the skip zones. So, you know, you might biopsy an area where there's no, no giant cells and then you can kind of get a false negative. And uh, so what this is able to do is just kind of a different way of assessing that mm -hmm. blood flow through there and uh, finding this in a non-invasive way. So it's a pretty cool test. Um, um, and besides but, the skip zones, Greg, you know, it, it, I hate to say it, but not all pathologists are created equal. It's how well somebody examines that. And I've seen negative biopsies become positive when they're re-read. So there are a lot of things that can go wrong there. Now, initial symptoms in giant cell headache, polymyalgia, rheumatic, I mean, these patients who have this uh, this disease, I tell them, any, any patient funkiness at all, I want you to come to me immediately. You know, there's a hair, chair, stair, maybe fair. Hair hurts when they comb their hair. Chair, they have trouble getting out of the recliner. Stair, hard to walk upstairs. And I put in their fair because we used to think this was a Caucasian disease, but it does happen to people of color. So do not uh, think if a person of color, you know, can't have giant cells, they can. Fevers of unknown origin. Visual symptoms without vision loss, like TIA and double vision, weakness, malaise, fatigue. And these don't have to be gangbuster symptoms either. They can actually be relatively mild. They're not necessarily debilitated patients. Now, what could all these things have in common? They can all have a normal exam. So we have to look in the elderly people that uh, kind of headache or any of the, these kind of findings. And we take a look at the, the vascular distribution. We got the occipital artery, the lingual artery, the facial, the ophthalmic, temporal. So the head paint doesn't have to be right here. It can be at the top of the head. It can be in the occiput. You know, it can be the, the head pain or the scalp pain can be anywhere. And the only thing magical about the temporal artery is that it's accessible, uh, accessible and expendable. You don't need it. If you really want to, you know, look at your diagnostic yield and you increase that, you biopsy the aorta, right? But you need your aorta. You can't do that. So that's why we biopsy the temporal artery. But it may not be involved at all. Maybe it could be the acceptable artery or the lingual artery. So vision loss, then findings, ischemic neuropathies, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and posterior ischemic optic neuropathy where the optic nerve looks pristine, but they have profound vision loss. And that is virtually always giant cell arteritis. Central retinal artery occlusions, about 5% are caused not by emboli, but caused by autoimmunity. Transient is ischemic attack and transient double vision. These are all visual loss and ocular findings from giant cell. 
So in treating the, these patients, they really need to be admitted to the hospital if they have an ischemic neuropathy. Now, the biopsy, sometimes you can get a negative biopsy, and that's why it's important to look at the, at the report. It may say no giant cells. Well, only 50% of these biopsies that are positive have giant cells. They can have histiocytes or monocytes. But there may be no active arteritis. But if it says focal interruption of the lamina, that's a healed arteritis, and they've got the disease. That's why you get these negative biopsies. And that's why I've kind of gone away from it. It's so much easier to get an ultrasound. These people need IV steroids when they have vision loss. They, they need hydration. They're going to need, need things for their diabetes. They're going to need things to sleep. Watch out for the gastric ulceration. And this is best done through the ER. I'm going to, I'm going to point out, look at this dosing right here. They need 250 milligrams solumedrol or methylprednisolone every six hours for three days. So they need 12 doses. And the reason I'm telling you this is I always get a call from the ER physician and or the hospitalist who's going to admit the patient, and they ask me, what is the dosing and how do we administer it? And I tell them, you know, one gram divided dosage, three days admitted IV, followed by 60 to 80 milligrams, and they need to be released to uh, to a rheumatologist. And I'll ask, do you, are you able to get a biopsy or do you want to get an ultrasound? You know, these are all things that we all work together on. 66-year-old female, new son of onset vision loss. She's 2,400, but she's always been 2,400 due to her macular scar, but she noticed a change in her visual field. There's an inferior arcuate defect uh, that was new. She had some disc edema, a little bit of pallor, no hemorrhages, no tail injectasia, it was a very small, crowded disc at risk in each eye, less than 0.2 CD ratio. Mild headache relieved by over-the-counter analgesics. A little bit of malaise and loss of appetite. She lost about seven pounds over four weeks. No jaw claudication, no temporal head pain. She was your typical Sarasota suburbanite. She was there in her town's outfit and just feeling a little bit off. And the question is, what do you do? Do you call this a you know, non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy? You absolutely do not. So her sed rate was 96. Within three hours, she was in, you know, in a hospital having steroids put into her arm. Fortunately, her loss was in her bad eye, and we maintained her good, her good eye vision. Non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy is diagnosed in the negative. How do you diagnose it? Prove what it isn't. It isn't arteritic. How do you prove it isn't? Get the test. Now, even a person who I do not think has an arteritic ischemic neuropathy, I will get the test. It's very easily done. And here's the thing we all need to be able to think about. I have a resident. We meet every week. Every week, I, I, I have her repeat this to me. Any acute vision loss in the elderly is giant cell until proven otherwise. And by definition, elderly, don't, don't hate me for this, it's 50 or above. So anytime you have acute vision loss in an older person, this is the first thing you need to think about. Always put this at the top of your differential. Greg, any comments or questions coming in? Nope, everything's good right now. I will put the well, hand out in. Uh, I was going to ask well. if you did that. Okay. She's a 31 year old female, complains of temporal blind spot in her left eye for about a year. Ocular history she was amblyopic and had childhood patching, mildly reduced vision, probably 20, 30. Medical history she had no menstruation since she stopped birth control pills. Uh, and her physician said, enjoy it while it lasts. She went to a second physician who inquired about the potential of galacteria. The patient denied because it wasn't well explained to her, and she didn't understand what galacteria was. And we take a look, and she's got uh, a nicely pink and perfused nerve in the right eye and the left eye. We have a wee bit of temporal pallor. It's nice to be able to compare the right to the left eye. These are just different size photographs, uh, different uh, different field of view, but there is some temporal temporal pallor there, and that's an amblyopic, do a visual field, and there's a bitemporal defect from a pituitary adenoma. 
Optic atrophy is a cavalierly used term. If you're using this without explaining it, you might as well write down, I think the patient has a brain tumor. I choose to do nothing about it. The six criteria that you need, need pallor, some nerve, sorry, nerve fiber layer defect, the pupil defect, if it's unilateral, a field defect, a vision defect, or a color defect. You have to have some something wrong there. Now, you can write down pallor if, there, if, if the visual function is all good. Patients may have pseudopallor, maybe the, the appearance of their optic nerve or, or pseudophagic pseudopallor. But if you're writing down optic atrophy, you know, there's certain criteria that are going to that are going to be there. And don't assume that it's old. You can have primary optic atrophy where the, the disc is white, but the margins are nicely distinct. The vessels are normal. And we see this in, in trauma and compression cases from tumors. You get a secondary optic atrophy from chronic disc edema, such as malignant hypertension, papilledema, infiltrate disease, leukemia, sarcoidosis. And here's a patient uh, who is a, a diagnosed glaucoma patient, elevated pressures, and we can see a nice pink perfused nerve on the right, but segmental pallor from 12 until 3 o'clock. And this is exactly the type of thing that needs to be investigated. We just can't say, oh, yeah, the patient has glaucoma or the patient had a non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy, especially in something as cupped as that nerve. Consecutive optic atrophy from degenerative conditions such as retinitis pigmentosa, high myopia, an old artery occlusion. And you can have a pale, kind of a waxy disc, uh, attenuation of the arterioles. Temporal disc pallor, if it's bilateral, you're probably looking at a toxicity of some sort, heavy metals, some sort of drug use, maybe nutritional, B12 or folate may be uh, low or demyelinating optic neuritis uh, if it is unilateral. So there are a lot of etiologies, but we have to do something. We have to investigate them, or we have to have an explanation. If you show me optic nerve pallor, and I just had PRP extensively, I'm fine with that. You show me temporal pallor with a large macular scar, I'm fine with that. But it could be infarction, infection, infiltration, compression. So MRI, the orbits and chiasm, and brain with and without contrast, two separate uh, scans with fat suppression for the orbit uh, in a high field unit. The contrast dye is going to help identify malignant disease, demyelinating plaques, uh, and multiple sclerosis. We must do something. We must look into it. Systemic causes are numerous: sarcoidosis, tuberculosis. Uh, syphilis, infectious diseases. In this case, I'm going to work with a primary care physician and let him or her know what my thought process is, and we can work and order the test together. I will order the neuroimaging. I'll work the serology with the primary care physician. But at a minimum, they're going to have CBC, SEDRAE, ACE, ANA, cardiolipin, homocysteine, B12, folate, RPR and VDRL, uh, FTABS, these are all things that are going to be necessary. Any possibility, you may need to do a heavy metal screening, look for any possible drugs that could be causing optic nerve toxicity. Chest x-rays are going to be helpful, looking for tuberculosis or sarcoidosis, but we must look when patients have optic atrophy. Greg, anything? Uh, we're good. All right, excellent. Well, I want to talk about something very, very common, PVD and retinal detachment. You know, we got these collagen fibrils that are supported by hyaluronic acid. And these fibrils are going to attach to the, the retina uh, in, in other parts of the fundus in very specific uh, areas. There's a pretty firm adhesion at the vitreous base uh, of the vitreous to the retina, at the optic nerve, at the macula, along areas of coral retinal scarring, along blood vessels, along the edges of lattice, and a vitreal retinal tuft. So these are areas where there's vitreal retinal adhesion. As a person ages, there's a loss of hyaluronic acid. Uh, we're getting, these collagen fibrils are going to lose support. 
They're going to develop uh, pockets of liquefied vitreous. And as we all know, over time, we can have a collapse in a posterior vitreous detachment. Now, in these areas of vitreal retinal adhesion, that can lead to a retinal hair formation and with subsequent retinal detachment. You know, one study done many years ago looking at uh, nearly 600 symptomatic patients, symptomatic with floaters, you know, those patients complain of diffuse spots. You know, about half had a retinal tear, and by diffuse spots, you know, blood. If they had vitreal cells, particularly pigmented cells, that the risk goes up. And if there's vitreous blood with an acute PVD, the likelihood uh, of a tear being there is very, very high. A lot of times you'll see this nice, clean uh, vitriol detachment. Uh, we've got the Weiss's ring. But a number of times you're actually going to see, see a darker darkness here representing blood that's attached to this uh, posterior aspect of the vitreous. And when I see blood, we've got to look very, very carefully for a potential retinal tear. But when I see blood that is sort of uh, consigned to this area about the Weiss's ring, Often, it's tearing of the disc capillaries when it comes out, and there may not be a tear there, but we still have to look fastidiously for a tear. Now, here's a patient that I, I, I've seen several of these uh, in the last several weeks. We can see here some inferiorly located pre-retinal hemorrhage in association with a posterior vitreal detachment. And when we see that, we have to have a high suspicion that there may be a, a tear out there somewhere. Now, here's a caveat that's very important to remember. Now, when, I, when I've seen these patients, I start by examining the patient upright. And when I have the patient examined upright, I look in fairly, these hemorrhages are actually pretty easy to find. Now I'm going to look at the peripheral retina again. I'm going to recline the patient for scleral depression. In virtually every case, when I recline the patient, they're supine, I can't find the, front, the, the hemorrhage any longer. It's like ketchup that spreads out. I sit them back up. A couple of minutes later, I'm going to find the hemorrhages inferiorly. Lay them back down. Look, not going to see it. So on those acute PVDs, look at them upright and supine. When they're supine, you know, the gravity kind of spreads out. I can't find the hemorrhage there. So when, when looking at these patients, you know, you got an acute PVD and there's some vitreous or pre-retinal hemorrhage, but you can't find a break. Now you look with a three mirror, a 90, uh, a BIO, you've done scleral oppression, you, you consulted a psychic, whatever you need to do. If you can't find a break, you need to look at them every two weeks or get a second opinion. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Now, if there's still no break, growth break seen, and this often happens, uh, you know, I've got, a, I've got retinal specialists in my practice. They look, they don't find anything either. Uh, usually that posterly located uh, hemorrhage is often just from tearing of the disc capillaries. There really isn't a tear. Now let's look at where things can sometimes go awry for, for uh, optometrists. Patient complained of floater, was, was diagnosed by an optometrist who dilated, uh, did an indirect ophthalmoscopic examination. The retina was intact, warned the, warned the patient of the signs and symptoms of retina attachment, uh, returned as soon as possible if you notice any changes, and probably sent him for, you know, sent him for like a, like a six-week follow-up. Well, patient ex uh, has vision reduction on a Thursday. Gets a little bit worse on Friday. Wants to wait to see if it'll clear up. Comes in on Monday with a macular off retinal attachment and unfortunately sues the optometrist. Now, going through the case, uh, it, it was a malpractice case. I was, I was defending the optometrist. But they had an, an expert witness, another optometrist, who was opining for the plaintiff uh, and did something that, that I, I really hate to see. Uh, and this is a person who was actually a low vision practitioner who had a two-page resume, double-spaced. And when it was brought up that, you know, the optometrist dilated and looked and saw nothing. 
And that person, the, the expert written said, he didn't look well enough. You know, he didn't, th to say that I think is just, uh, just irresponsible. You don't know what happened in the exam. He's a qualified optometrist. But to say he didn't look well enough to, uh, to try to cast dispersion is just irresponsible. Now, here's what I call snatching defeat out of the jaws of victory. Patient presents with reduced visual acuity. An optometrist diagnosed central serous based upon an OCT, but didn't dilate the patient to confirm it. And this was actually a malpractice case, and it went to trial. The optometrist won the case. And he won because they had a very poor expert witness for the plaintiff, but it got overturned on appeal uh, based upon a technicality, and they had to retry the case. And at this point, they had asked me to come in and to uh, to opine in defense of the optometrist. And I said, uh, I'd like to help. So I asked them to, uh, to send me the records. And this is a representative image. And one of the first things that popped up was uh, was that. And it was clearly a macula off retinal detachment. And I asked, you know, how how did how did you win this? And he said, well, OCT at that time is relatively new. There is one cut of the OCT that looked like central serous. We had a book with pictures. We showed the jury a book with central serous to look like that. And that's how they judged in his favor. At that point, I said, uh, the, the evidence is there. The, the diagnosis was wrong. Now, how do we protect ourselves? What's the best? You know, it's the economy, stupid. It's the record. The record is very, very critical. Here's another case I was asked to opine uh, in defense, but it was in defense of the prison system. This was an inmate. And they wanted ultimately me to opine against a private uh, uh, per diem optometrist who examined him. And we take a look here, and this is a person who is incarcerated, and this is the record. Greg, what do you think of that record? Anything there that impresses you much? Uh, it's pretty busy record, but I don't see a lot on it. No. I count 13 <laughs> words. I mean, would, would you like to be facing a malpractice case with 13 words to defend you? The answer is no. <laughs> Yeah. But they had just enough. So right here is the most important word. And put it in the chat room, guys. What's that word say? Can you tell me what that says? It says follow-up ophthalmology, evaluate OS, and this, that. Anybody? Can anybody tell me what that says? All right, uh, uh, a lot of people say macula. Okay, and that's it. And that's the most important thing. That word right there is what I think saved the optometrist because I myself worked in a prison system as a as a young practitioner. And it's not like you can prescribe a medicine, the patient can go out and get it. Everything has to be approved and looked at by the medical director who may be a primary care physician. Said, I asked the medical director, you know, could, could the person read this? No. Okay, well, it was his responsibility to pick up the phone, call the optometrist, and ask, what does that word say? So they uh, they capitulated and they settled, and uh, the optometrist did not get sued. Here's a great example of how it should be done. Not many more words, okay? Patient states having a lot of floaters. Many started this, uh, this morning. Ba 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 ba. What do I see here that I like? Pressures are good. There's some things missing here. Exam is done, very important. Dilation, what did they use? 1% madriosal, 2.5% neosinephrine. Both eyes, uh, pressures are there. Now we've got the check marks. It looks like he had to check everything off except one thing. What does it say? Incomplete PVD attached at periphery. All right, impression. Vitreous detachment, right eye incomplete and symptomatic. Educated signs, symptoms, retinal detachment, three weeks. Return sooner if symptoms already occur, follow up three weeks. I don't know about you, Greg, but I'm pretty impressed by this record. Everything that I need is there. Yeah, I look at this and everything is there to my satisfaction. Hey, this is my record. 
Okay, this 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 is actually the my record that I, I put up here. Okay, PVD person. I tell what drops I use there. Lens is used 90 and 20, scoil depression 360, examine upright and reclined, posterior vitreous detachment, no vitreous hemorrhage, no cells. Very important stuff to write. The most important things you can write is what did you do? Did you dial it? How did you examine the patient? You know, you can write all of this. You know, or a scene, 360 degrees. I want you to write all of this stuff down whenever you see a new onset PVD. Pavia, only write it if you've done it. All right? But this is, I put this on every patient that, that, I, that I specifically looked for. This is what will keep you out of trouble should something happen. Greg, anything, anything going on out there? Everything's quiet. All right. Well, we're going to play a little game I like to call Optometric Malpractice, Fact or Fiction. Now, what is malpractice? It is a dereliction of professional duty or a failure to exercise an ordinary degree of professional skill or learning, rendering professional services which results in a permanent injury, loss, or damage. It's an injurious, negligent, or improper practice. That is what malpractice is. There are patients out there that think if they had a bad experience with you, they can sue you. They can sue you. It is not true. They can threaten you. It is not true. Now I'm going to talk to you about some of my experience as an expert witness. And I don't know how many cases I've done. It's somewhere between 50 and 100 cases, probably closer to 100 than 50. I'm going to tell you right now, optometric malpractice is uncommon. Eye cases are relatively rare. Most attorneys don't want to get involved with it because there's not a lot of money. They don't know the eye. Their words, not mine. But as an expert witness, you know, my job is to handle an adversarial situation. When I'm deposed, I am going to be treated only marginally better than the doctor being sued. It's important to be fair and objective. I want to see the right thing done. If a, if a patient has been wrong, they deserve redress. But I also don't want to see an optometrist uh, suffer for what would have been the natural outcome of the disease. And balance is important. When I'm deposed, there's a series of questions I'm going to be asked that I have to answer. They're going to ask, have you ever done this before? The answer is yes. Has your opinion ever been disqualified in a court of law? The answer is no. Um, do you charge a fee for your services? The answer is no. Oh, yes. So I do charge fee, a fee for my services. Uh, do you keep the fee that you charge? The answer is no. My wife gets it. Do you charge or do you do you advertise in legal journals? The answer is no. And then they'll ask, for whom do you testify? And if one were to say 100% for the defense or 100% for the plaintiff, you're going to be cast as being biased. The vast majority of what I do is in defense of optometrists. I will take and have taken plaintiff's cases, and there are reasons that, that I've done this. The most important thing is to educate. They just don't know the eye. There's no high courtroom drama here. It is mostly done in conferences, and it usually settles. Now, there are some common errors that expert witnesses do make, and I've seen it happen many a time. Sometimes they, got, they think they're going to win the case. They're trying to win the case. And they try so hard, they end up impugning their own credibility. Like when, when an expert witness says, oh, he looked, but he didn't look well enough. He didn't do a good enough job. And that's, that's irresponsible. And thinking that you must go all the way through. There are many cases where I've been dismissed because I, I, I wasn't supportive of, of the case, either way, defense or, or, or plaintiff. 
Now, there are some patient considerations. Some patients have been legitimately wrong. The case I was just involved with last week and is still going on now involved bilateral blindness from a delay in, di in diagnosis in giant cell. Some patients are just angry and looking to blame, and they start looking for an attorney. And the attorney may be interested, and now the attorney starts looking into it. I have seen the economy enhancing malpractice claims. People have lost their jobs. Patient people have lost uh, their insurance. This is this is an economic stimulus for them. Patient depositions, when I read them, they're mind-numbingly boring. You know, they'll ask stupid questions like, do you, does your ear ever itch? Uh, when your ear itches, do you scratch it? Do you scratch it with your right hand? Do you scratch it with your left hand? But this is the assessment factor. They're trying to find out. And a lot of times they, they, they will get through hours of deposition and they'll ask the, you know, they, they'll have the patient detail all the things that they can't do. They can't, they can't work. They can't do yard work. They can't ride their bike. They can't work on their computer. And that patient's under surveillance. They, they, at that point, they probably already had video of the patient doing everything they say they can't do. Now, common patient complaints that I hear uh, in the in the intent to litigate: vision loss, field loss, loss of ability to lead a normal life, constant dizziness from, from vision loss or visual field loss, intractable headache from visual field loss or vision loss. I just got a, a call a couple of weeks ago about a, from a plaintiff's attorney asking me to uh, become an expert witness to opine against the doctor. Now, the doctor is one of my former students, and obviously I'm not going to do that. But I had a nice conversation. I tried to explain to him the nuances and why this may not be a very good case from the litigation. I said, what is the patient, what is, what is the patient telling you? Oh, a patient has this you know, untractable headache, they have constant headaches, they can't work, and they, they get dizzy. And I said, your, your patient, your, your, your client is lying to you. Because I think we all know that uh, a good practitioner in an independent medical exam can detect faking vision loss. They can detect faking field loss, but dizziness and headache are the greatest symptoms in the world. Everybody, anybody on a jury understands it, they get it. They they know what dizziness and headache is. And you can't prove it. Can't prove they don't have it. So I, I'll tell any attorney, anytime a patient says that their vision loss is causing headache or dizziness, they're lying. And I'll tell them, I'll just tell them right, right out, your, your client is lying. Now, put it in the chat room, guys. If you sue for malpractice, the plaintiff's attorney will have as an expert witness an ophthalmologist that hates optometry. Is that fact or fiction? Put it in the chat room. I want to see it. What do you think? Is that fact or is that fiction? I hear a fact. So, Joe, as that's rolling mm -hmm. in, um, yeah. I had a private message come in here. Mm -hmm. It says, you know, you're talking about the PVDs and dilation and so on and so forth. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase. It basically says, um, you know, it brings up a different topic, the gold standard of dilated fundus exam with BIO on the routine exam, uh, claiming, you know, no one performs, you know, a dilated exam on these routine exams um, whenever now there's kind of digital photos and you can charge, you know, X amount of dollars for it. So, you know, the the question, I guess, is, you know, for that routine exam, you know, the person coming in with that vision exam, asymptomatic, I'll put that in there, that wasn't in there, but they're asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do we have to do a DFE in a sense uh, uh, with a with a BIO? I can tell you in the state of Florida, the answer is yes. So it may be actually in your practice act. My belief is, I think the first exam should be with a dilation. If you want to use imaging after that, and there's no change of symptoms, the answer would be that's probably okay. So most people are saying that this is a fact, and it is actually fiction. Ophthalmologists do not make good expert witnesses in optometric malpractice cases. They have to sign an affidavit stating they're intimately familiar with the training of optometrists and the standard of practice of optometry, and most of them can't. So this is my first polling question, Greg. If an attorney thinks that there's been negligence, he or she can sue you for malpractice. Is that fact or fiction? 
And Joe, back to the, the question that we had here, you know, I think it has to pertain to knowing your optometric practice act, you know, well, because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously in Florida that you'd be outside your optometric practice act. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say you're in a state that doesn't have it in their optometric practice act and they come in and I, I heard you say that they, um, you know, you feel that they should be done. Then after that, you can do imaging. Um, if they're asymptomatic, um, do you feel you're, you're okay? I mean, you know, there's wide field images get out there pretty far. Just, you know, just kind of getting your thoughts because that's where it's going to go back sure. and forth. You know, AI the, and the, imaging is pretty amazing. So, yeah, I think we're a couple iterations from, from doing away with dilation altogether. We're not quite there yet, but I think we're going to get to a point where we won't be dilating because the imaging will be that good. Greg, I'm going to say nobody argues with a good outcome. That's right. Exactly. But if, the, if there's a bad outcome, something was missed and it's going to be argued. I, I, I've, I've seen cases where the imaging clearly showed there was nothing there and we're actually showed where it was there. <laughs> and I was actually involved in one case where a treating ophthalmologist actually did uh, actually Photoshop the, uh, the optos image wow. that, that ended the case right there. So a lot of people think it's fact. Some people think it's fiction. The answer is it's fiction. They just can't sue you because they want to. They have to have a medical uh, medical opinion that, that supports potential negligence. They need somebody to look at the case and say there is something there. So they a, a patient can't come in angry, hire an attorney, and then sue you. They need a medical opinion that says there is a potential case here. Tavian. Very important. I'll write this down. Remember this, guys. <clears throat> when you get a request for your records, particularly from an attorney subpoena, there's usually a window where you have to respond. It's usually 10 days. Do it. Make sure it's complete. Don't alter it. Do it. Because if you don't respond in the appropriate amount of time, then they can sue you without getting a medical opinion. So send the records. So this is a plaintiff's case. I was I was hired to opine against the optometrist to say, is there a case here? Patients being treated for glaucoma has a history of ocular histoplasmosis syndrome with an old cortical neovascular membrane, was treated years ago with avastin. So it has a little bit of a little, little bit of a retinal issue going on. There is moderate cupping pressure is 22 and 24 on one visit. Personally, I think the diagnosis of glaucoma was a little dodgy, but I wasn't there. Okay, I'll give you that. Patient develops advancing field loss, then acuity loss over a six-month period. What had happened was the optometrist was following the patient, you know, thought things might have been changing, had set the patient for a six-month appointment. If anything gets worse, come back in sooner. But the patient came back after six months with some profound uh, vision loss. Got referred to ophthalmology, got sent to a retinal specialist, then to a neuro-ophthalmologist. The patient had an optic nerve tumor. Patient and family are very angry they go to an attorney. This is slam dunk mal malfeasance, don't you think, guys? You know, this is the this is the horrible, you know, I'm treating glaucoma, and it's actually a tumor. So the attorney knows a little bit very little about the eye. He asked me what, you know, asked my opinion. And I do this with all the attorneys. After I've looked it over, I, I, I say, do you want my opinion? Do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? And if they want to direct me a certain way, I won't get involved with them any further. And it's no, look, Doc, I don't know this. You need to help me. Tell me what's going on here. Okay. Well, here's the facts. Like, patient's multiple diagnosis, probably has glaucoma, has retinal vision loss, had old histoplasmosis syndrome. So there are multiple things going on. Optic nerve sheath meningioma is about less than 2% of all orbital tumors. It's rare. Not many people see that. And there's some delay in diagnosis about six months. You know, maybe the patient could have come back after three months when they started noticing the vision going downhill, not wait six months. But would have made a difference, okay? Bad things happen to the optic nerve. When the optic nerve gets involved, bad things happen. I explained this all to him. He said, okay, thank you very much. We're not going to take the case. So case aboard. These are some of the reasons why I will take a plaintiff's case, because if there's nothing there, I will tell them there is nothing there. Here's a plaintiff case I took, flashes and floaters. 
They want to know, can we sue this? Can we sue this optometrist? Patient has symptoms on a Monday, gets examined as a PVD, educated, develops more symptoms on a Saturday. Comes in Sunday, calls the optometrist, the you know, optometrist goes in and just dilates and takes a look. Doesn't record any exam, no exam recorded at all. But according to the patient, the doctor said, oh crap, you have a retinal detachment. Seen Monday by a retinal specialist, patient is NPO, and that's actually in the history. So even though he, the optometrist didn't record anything about the exam, he obviously looked, he obviously told him something, he obviously said, don't eat uh, after midnight, you're going to have surgery tomorrow. So, you know, the, the, the patient is angry, wants to sue the optometrist, so I'm asked to opine against the optometrist. And this is the same one we just looked at. And what did I tell you earlier? This is a great record. This is a fan. Everything I need to know is right there. The diagnosis, what he did, how he did, and there's a change in symptoms. So I went back and I told the I told the attorney, I said, in my, you know, my estimation, in all medical probability, there was not a tear at the time of this examination. And I don't believe that there's a case here. And he said, thank you very much. I'm going to encourage my uh, my pay, my client not to sue. So everything is in there, dilation, meds used, lenses used, good description. There was a change in symptoms that's consistent in the literature. Do you want me my, my opinion or I tell you what, what you want to hear? So I want your opinion. It's all about medical probability. There is no case here. So thank you very much. We, we're not going to waste our time. All right, guys. 60-year-old female seen by, seen by an optometrist here in my own home state of Florida. Routine examination, pressures in the upper 40s. Lists her as a glaucoma suspect, treats her topically for about two years, and lowers pressure down to the low to mid 20s. Seeks care from an ophthalmologist on multiple medications, pressures in the mid 20s at this point. And the reason I had to go to the ophthalmolo another ophthalmologist was change in insurance. So, goes to uh, an ophthalmologist on multiple medicines at that time, pressure in the mid 20s. He doesn't like it. He changes the medicine, gets the pressure a little bit lower, does a trabecular tre plastic, then a trabeculectomy. Sues the optometrist. I'm retained by the plaintiff's uh, uh, patient's attorney to opine against the optometrist. So allegations, this is the allegations from the malpractice suit. This, th this is what everything is based upon. Detected elevated pressure and only used topical medicines. Diagnosed glaucoma, failed to warn serious nature. Failed to diagnose optic nerve injury. Failed to treat optic nerve injury. Failed to refer to ophthalmologists. Greg, what's your opinion here? Any thoughts? Joe, I am trying to help someone get back in. So I'm going to go back to that. Sorry, I'm not, I have, no, I'm not no, paying attention. No worries. <laughs> no, it's okay. I I, I, very, I very frequently will will enjoy my own uh, mental pina colada, but I'll tell you right now that uh, these are all very limp. All right, to me, the, none of none of these are 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 compelling. Detected elevated pressure, only use topical medicines. Well, that's what we generally do uh, in glau uh, in glaucoma. Diagnosed glaucoma, failed to warn serious nature. That's what he said. She said we can work with that, but failed to diagnose and treat optic nerve injury. Well. The attorney thought the patient had glaucoma and an optic nerve injury, not realizing they're the same thing. And also failed to refer to ophthalmologist and, you know, he didn't have, he, there's no obligation. And the attorney was in, under the impression that this optometrist was obligated to refer glaucoma to an ophthalmologist. And the reason was because I looked at the records and in the in the very first visit with the ophthalmologist, it said saw an optometrist who did not even recommend referral. The old, if only you had been referred, I could have saved. If only they did, I could have done it. You know, never, never, never opine what might have happened to somebody else's office. So none of this is actually impressive. There, to me, there's no case here whatsoever. Now let's look at the files. Medications are obviously added and changed, but there's no notation. On, on the first day, patient was started on A medicine. Two years later, patients on three different medicines have no idea how they got there. 
No CD re was recorded for the first year and a half, and when it was, it was wrong. One time a dilated exam was performed, nothing was recorded. No gonia was ever performed, no fields were ever performed, but the frame style, bifocal style, seg height, PD, tempo length, coding, chair, all those were well recorded. That's the only thing that I actually could read was, was things about the material. So guys, put in the chat. Is this malpractice? Are the allegations accurate? What do you think? Not a polling question, just put it in the chat and let me see what you think. Hear yes, I hear a no. Hear yes, yes, no, yes, 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 yeah, no, yes. All right, so we're kind of really split here. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about this. When looking this case over, there are two questions that I had to ask and answer to myself. First question, if this optometrist had done nothing on the first day, what would have happened? Likely she would have gotten worse. He started her on medicines, changed medicines, and got nearly a 50% pressure reduction. That's pretty good. Now, granted, he forced gumped his way through it. This is not good care. Had this been reported to the Florida board, the person would have been sanctioned. Now, what also happens to a 60-year-old person of color, female, Caribbean descent, with a pressure nearly 50? They're going to use all the medicines. They're going to undergo a laser and probably need surgery. It was the natural history of the disease. So when I went back, I said, I don't believe that malpractice was, has occurred. Now, I didn't tell them about poor, the poor care that was involved. I said, there's this person's actions or inactions, in my opinion, did not contribute to the outcome. And I said, thank you very much. Uh, in the absence of a, of a positive uh, opinion for you, we're going we're gonna to drop the case. We're not going to move forward. Which was very, very fortunate because this optometrist had sold his practice to a young practitioner. She was employing him. She got sued as well. That always happens. Because she did not see the patient, her malpractice carrier refused to cover her. She had no coverage for this incident. Had this gone, fit, gone forward, she would have had to declare bankruptcy and leave the state. Now, cases of optometric malpractice typically involve obvious negligence and are clearly straightforward. Is that fact or fiction? Guys, put it in the, put it in the chat room. Is that fact or fiction? Here, fiction. Fiction. We got a couple fictions here. Oh, everybody's saying fiction. Yeah, I like it. It's fiction. It's not usually black and white, but it's shades of gray. I was retained as a defense expert in a case with pigmentary glaucoma. The optometrist called me, told me about the case, asked me if I, if I could help out. I said, sure, described it pretty well, but uh, I left a few important details out. You know, the IOP was uncontrolled, pressure is 32, didn't like his medicine. The doctor completely changed the regimen. You know, stop two medicines, starts two other medicines, but schedules a uh, a six month appointment. Now, yeah, you know, you can argue that maybe the patient should have been seen a little sooner than that. Um, is it frankly wrong? No, it's not black and white, but there are shades of gray. But you know, the patient underwent multiple surgery, end up with light perception vision, and did sue two doctors for two million dollars each. And maybe we could have seen the patient back a little bit sooner, but was six months frankly wrong? It's kind of hard to say, but like I said, not usually black and white, but usually shades of gray. I'm going to skip this one. Yeah, we'll stay here. We'll do this one. I was retained as a plaintiff expert. Patient had angle closure, you know, at, at angle closure, underwent multiple surgeries, and sued ultimately his optometrist and subsequent ophthalmologist. And in in the in the history, said eye pain and headache, especially watching TV at night, dimming of the left eye, nasal visual field. All right. Well, the patient probably had intermittent angle closure previously. 
but you know the patient's complaining of, of visual field uh, defects and no formal fields were done by the optometrist but you know how much damage could have been avoided at that point well patient always complaining about visual field so they're kind of a shades of gray but sometimes it is black and white. I was actually retained as a defense expert to opine for the optometrist. Patient saw an optometrist for 15 years. Dutiful patient did whatever the optometrist asked him to do. And the patient lost the uh, field and fixation from a chronic disease, pigmentary glaucoma. Now, I get the records, and these are handwritten records, worse than I've probably ever seen. They're incredibly illegible. I mean, the CD seemed like symbol, like he's writing in symbols. I have no, I can't even read it. And I tell the attorney, I can't even read this. Can you can you get a clarification? So a couple of weeks later, I get the charts again with the optometrist took a red pen and wrote in the same illegible handwriting next to everything. So look, I need a complete synopsis of what happened. Next thing I do, I get a one-page summary of, uh, of 15 years of care. Right? Does this guy know we're trying to help him? And the bottom line is, you know, it starts with a patient who had pressure of 12, ultimately got up to pressure of 29, but never did an evaluation. And my recommendation is, you know, settle this case. This is not one you want to take to a jury. All right. There's no such thing as practicing defensive medicine, fact or fiction. Put it in the chat, guys. Can you, can you practice defensive medicine? Get all the tests done. Send the patient out. Refer the patient out. Getting facts, getting fictions. Looks like we're about 50 50 50 split between fact and fiction. Can we practice defensive medicine? Do every test possible and make all the referrals so we don't get sued. There's no such thing as defensive medicine. There's only practicing standard of care and recording what you did clearly in your chart. Revisiting pigmentary glaucoma being managed in the, in the VA system. Uh, patient uh, has pigmentary glaucoma, can't get into his VA doctor, goes to a private optometrist, pressures 47 because he is not compliant with his medicine. The optometrist refers him to, he doesn't manage glaucoma, refers him to an, an ophthalmology optometry center. Patient gets sees, is seen there three days later, pressure is 21. Well, you know, the, because the patient, you know, his eye was hurting, he starts using his medicine. Two months later, comes back to the optometrist, pressure is 53. Not using his medicine. Optometrist is very, very uncomfortable. He's an older practitioner at the end of his career, never, you know, doesn't do glaucoma, never been sued. Works to get him seen next day at a glaucoma specialist. He was referred for $2 million for not referring fast enough. I mean, he referred, right? He referred the person the next day. How could he be in trouble for, you know, being that defensive? Well, when he got sued, he got the attempt to litigate. And he did the worst thing he could possibly do. He answered it himself. And he wrote the, how this was an emergency situation. He worked very hard to get the patient seen. He kept saying it was an emergency, it was an emergency. Well, the attorney said, if it's an emergency, why didn't you refer it the same day? Yeah, he sunk his own case. More defensive medicine. A woman has a normal exam with the optometrist. Complains of headache, double vision, wasn't addressed. Decline field testing. Palpitation fields were normal, but uh, fun, uh, uh, perimetry was declined. We also know optometrist 10 months later. This is uh, December 9th. He diagnoses papilledema, makes a referral to a retinal specialist, but the urgency is unclear. Patient sees a general ophthalmologist about six weeks later, looks at the patient, sends a stat right to the ER, you know. Now, what are the implications? He did refer, right? You know, he he did refer, but the referral was not at the to the right person at the right interval. Optometrists in commercial practices are more likely to be sued for malpractice than doctors in private office. Is that fact or fiction? Put it on in there, docs. What is it? 
Yeah, I think this is a pretty easy one. Everybody's saying kind of the same thing. Everybody's saying it's fiction, and we're going to agree that's fiction. The majority of alchemical malpractice involves inappropriate use of therapeutics. Is that fact or fiction? Okay, people jumping in there. And the previous question was, I, I was doing something like this, and some, you know, somebody sent me a question, and you know, basically trying to ask it, if I stay in private, in private practice, don't go commercial, am I safe? And the answer is no. And everybody agrees this is all fiction. Three main offenders in optometric malpractice is failure to detect retinal attachment, failure to detect glaucoma, and failure to detect tumor. These are acts of omission, not commission. Anybody in any practice situation can run afoul of these things. Now, I will tell you, an up-and-comer recently is alleged mismanagement of keratitis. That would be acts of commission. But for the most part, these are acts of omission. In other words, it's failure to listen to the patient, failure to observe the signs, failure to make the diagnosis fit the findings instead of the other way around, failure to do the appropriate tests and follow-up, and failure to make the appropriate referral. And this is where we run afoul. Failure to listen to the patient, 47-year-old male, complains of hazy vision in his left eye. Was seen by an optometrist 16 months earlier, diagnosed microesotropia. I'm not sure if there's an eye turn or not, but that was used to, to uh, account for 20-25 vision left eye. But you know, people with microstrabs and amblyopia don't complain of hazy vision. Remember what I said earlier? Run down complaints. Six months later, sees an optometrist, another optometrist who diagnoses dry eye syndrome with the same visual acuity. Now the patient comes in 2020, 2070 with an apparent defect, temporal defects on compensation, dyschromatopsia, and a visual field that looks like this. And the patient had a compressive tumor. And, you know, to whom, you know, what, what test would have been helpful here? Visual field. You know, what referral would have been good? Anybody else, just for a second opinion. Hey, I'm having trouble. This patient's not satisfied. Can you take a look at the case and tell me what you think? Sorry to observe the signs. A 16-year-old comes in for contact lens fitting. Refraction plus one, minus one, 20, 40, plus 75, minus a half, uh, 20, 20. Fundus is written as within normal limits, no CD ratio. Diagnosed with refractive amblyopia, specifically refractive amblyopia in the right eye, and fit with contact lenses. Now, you should all be concerned out there. This is not an amblyogenic uh, refractive error. And it was specifically refractive amblyopia. At the two-week follow-up, his visual field, his visual acuity is 2100, and a good fit is recorded. And I can tell you, this was about the entirety of the whole chart for that visit. One month follow-up, vision is now 2,200, but it's still a good fit. And this is about the entirety of the follow-up visit. That result was on the chart. Patient's discharged. Comes back a year later, same refraction, now 2,400. Fundus is still within normal limits, and that's all that's written for the fundal examination. New lenses were ordered because they're rhetoric. They're in dispense. The patient says... We still not seeing that clear in the right eye. Another doctor picks up them uh, in the practice, picks up an ophthalmoscope and sees a retinal a chronic retinal detachment. My recommendation is try to settle this case. Does not need to go forward. This is a hard one to defend. He watched the ship go down. Fair to make the diagnosis fit the findings. 58-year-old female wakes with pain, photophobia, lacrimation. Now, exams previously have been normal. Presents with corneal edema and punctate epitheliopathy in the right eye and is diagnosed with a chemical keratitis because it looks like a chemical keratitis. The only problem is there is no history of getting anything in the eye. Now, upon questioning, she did acknowledge she had cleaned her house a day and a half earlier 
and it was felt by the optometrist, well, she probably got some fumes in the eye. It was just building up. But I felt fine afterwards. Yeah, it probably took a while to build up. So it treats her with Topradex. She gets worse. She has develops nausea and vomiting, goes to a second opinion, which is at the emergency room. Pressure is 58 because she has acute angle closure. And this is a failure to the appropriate tests and follow up. Appropriate tests, but I'm checking a pressure. Now, Greg, if, if, if somebody got, you know, is pouring chlorine into their pool and they splash up and it gets in their eye, they come in with the keratitis, are you going to die? Are you going to take a pressure in that situation? Uh, probably, yeah. It might not be contact, but I'll probably do an yeah. NCT type of uh, pressure. I don't think I would with that kind of history. But that history wasn't there. It's make the history, you know, findings fit the history. This was just missing angle closure. You know, sometimes I got to say, I just shake my head. I was retained for the defense of an optometrist. So a diabetic patient sees an optometrist who diagnoses proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Educates her, warns risk, permanent blindness, must see retinal specialists within seven days. I mean, this is actually written in the chart. Now, this optometrist was not in the patient's insurance network. So in order to get a referral to a, an ophthalmologist, the patient had to go for another examination to another optometrist within the referral network. So it sees another optometrist six weeks later who details a completely normal examination. Three months later, patient is now visually impaired from proliferative diabetic retina. So I'm talking to the attorney, and the attorney said, what do you think? I said, I said this is very straight. Look at me. He saw the patient, diagnosed PDR. He warned risk blindness. He, he did a great job. It's all very clear. The attorney said, no, it's the other guy we're defending. I said, uh, no, thank you. The attorney said, well, is it possible for the patient to have diabetic retinopathy in one visit? It clears up and then comes back? No, it's not. So thank you very much. I cannot participate. Sometimes you shake your head. Part two, I was asked to defend an optometrist who allegedly missed pseudoexfoliative glaucoma. So they, uh, the attorney calls me and said, we'd like you to get involved. Do you mind, do you mind uh, you know, looking at the case over and see if you can help us? I said, sure. I know a little bit about, a little bit about glaucoma. I mean, I think it has something to do with pressure. I'm not really sure. And the person they send me is an affidavit they want me to sign that says there's no evidence of glaucoma at this time. And they call the attorney and say, I'm happy to do that. If it's true, can you actually send me the records? And they send me the records. And this is the first thing that pops up were 0.9 CD ratios in each eye. And I said, I'm sorry, but there is definitely evidence of glaucoma at this time. You've got DNA. You've got you've got eyewitnesses and, and the murder weapon. You had less you had less uh, stuff in the OJ case, so I can't. I, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Very to diagnose retinal detachment. Yeah, there's actually a few things that have rolled in. You want to get them now, okay, or yeah, do you want to? All right, let me scroll down here. So someone's asking defense optometry question mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I if I see very narrow or possibly partially closed angle, and since I don't have a gonio available, I send a, to a glaucoma ophthalmologist for evaluation and treatment uh, and treatment if needed. Entirely appropriate. That and, that and I, is and, doing that is doing good care, standard of care. It's one thing to refer to somebody who can offer you something that you can't do, but. Referring to deflect blame or blur the account lines of accountability will never work. Uh, if I have electronic records, are we still required to also have a written record? No. Okay. And we're going to recircle back. Um, Keith wants to kind of get drilled down to uh, so is a dilated fundus exam with BIO the standard of care? Or not with routine insurance? What would how would you answer that? With routine insurance. I mean, are you saying like vision care? Yeah, like a vision care. Someone's coming in. I got you know, I have this X Y Z vision plan. Mm -hmm. You know, I 
uh, my employee has it. I'm going to get a, you know, get an eye exam today. Mm -hmm. um, is it, you know, most people out there, you know, the feeling is they're not dilating, they're not doing BIO. Mm -hmm. um, if that's the case, is it the standard of care? I would say it, it is not. I think I think there should be an, a, a dilated exam done at least once in the patient. In the state of Florida, I am mandated to do that. I think it's a good right. mandate. But yeah. after that, it's at your professional discretion. So I think, you know, dilating is a great idea. You know, does it have mm -hmm. to be BIO, what we're dr drilling down here to? I don't think so. As long as you're feeling comfortable assessing, I can tell you, I feel doing, I think I feel I do a better exam with an off-axis 90 um, you know, there's times whenever I looked at the BIO and didn't see the tear or saw something and then easily saw it with the 90. Now the BIO showed me maybe where I needed to look, but you know, the off axis 90, I get pretty heck, pretty far out there to the or serrata. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it just takes me a little bit longer because I have to go in little segments. So, you know, I'm doing a dilated exam. So, mm -hmm. okay. I think we're caught up. Thank you. I remember what I said, Greg, not black and white shades of gray. I actually, I actually had, I actually had that situation, and I supported the optometrist who did not do the BIO but did exactly what you said. But here's the most common one that I'm saying, and I, I, I've had three cases of giant cell arteritis. I've had numerous keratitis. The most common thing I see is failure to diagnose retinal detachment. Fifty-year-old male presents flashes and flutters, goes to an optometrist who dilates and does BIO. Records no breaks, no detachments, PVD. Warn signs and symptoms, retinal detachment, reappoints them for six weeks, dismisses the patient. Patient has worsening of symptoms and vision loss one week later. Telephones the optometrist after hours, gets patched through by his emergent, by the by his answering service. He's at dinner with his wife. Uh, here's a situation, says, I want you to see this friendly retinal specialist tomorrow, goes back to his dinner, goes about his day, goes to his office, forgot this ever happened, doesn't record it in the chart. Now, the patient has a retinal detachment with a poor surgical outcome. <laughs> Sues the optometrist for malpractice. Is it malpractice? Did he bre breach the standard of care? And here's a big issue. He had a telephone call with the patient. Told the patient what to do, but he didn't write in the chart. Forgot all about it. Brings me polling question number two, Greg. Anything not recording the patient's chart is considered not performed. Is that fact or is that fiction? If it's not in the chart, it never happened. Is that fact or is that fiction? You know, kind of going back to this discussion, it kind of keeps rolling into the chat room. I think mm -hmm. what I would say is that, you know, at one time, you know, Timolol was considered the standard of care of treating glaucoma until something came along that better replaced it, mm -hmm. um, like Zalatan. So, you know, times change and maybe we were taught things in school um, and maybe, you know, I can remember my glaucoma teachers saying the standard of care was Timolol. Um yeah, it's no longer the standard of care. So things change with times and technology that are out there. So. All right, so we have and we said fact. A lot of people feel fact. If you didn't write it down, it never happened. And it is actually fiction. The old adage, not written, not done, is not true. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means it's going to be harder to prove. Now, what I want to stress to you is there is other places information can come out. It can come out in deposition. It can come out of trial. What I want to advise people is never make a change late in, in a patient's chart that isn't legitimate, trying to make it look better. Let it happen. We want to record everything that we do for a patient, our phone calls, everything we do should be in the chart because the chart is our best protection. But what we want is as much clarity as we can. Now, could this optometrist have missed a break? Yeah, sure. He could have, he could have missed it. Could there have been a break not detectable to a good retinal specialist? Sure. 
Could have been no break initially, one formed after the exam. You know, that does happen. So in my opinion, it may have been a bad outcome, but this was not malpractice. And I was actually hired to opine against the optometrist by the patient's attorney. And I explained to him is that he met the standard of care. He did everything he needed to do. Now, inter now interestingly, when the patient went to the retinal specialist, you know, and the retinal specialist was deposed, he said, yeah, he called, the patient called the doctor, said, come to my office. There, it's in the record. Yeah, it didn't have to be, they have to add it later. It was there. It was introduced by the treating physician. Well, the plaintiff's attorney wanted me to see it his way. He said, I've got another optometrist who will stare on, swear on a stack of Bibles that this is malpractice. I don't know, better give him a call because I'm not going to do it. Even for, and he wasn't bribing me, but he was telling me how much money I was going to make in professional fees to see this all the way through trial. And my response was, no, thank you. And uh, I was summarily fired from the case. And I was, I, I was happy to, to, to leave that case. Now, I did see all the records, and this friendly retinal specialist was deposed, and the attorney asked, could this doctor have missed the retinal break? And the, the retinal specialist, well, yes, it's likely he did. He's not a physician, you know. Does that bother anybody out there? Is it, is it bothersome to you? It sounds pretty bad, but I want to I wanna caution you. What they're looking for is what is called the legal pot of gold. Now, as an expert, when I am being paid for my opinion, and they're trying to discredit me. The best thing an attorney can do, and they're very good at doing this, is to get another, another caregiver, another provider involved in the case who is not being sued and not being paid to say you did something wrong. And if they can get them to say that, that's a legal pot of gold that they can use against you. And I can tell you, depositions are adversarial. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's not waterboarding, but it is, it is an interrogation. I've had depositions go for two hours. I've had depositions go for five hours. It's endurance. They know what they're looking for. They know, they're knowing what they're going to do. And if they can get somebody to say something untoward against you, and you know, I'm sure this Ronald Spike, he's probably uncomfortable, and he just let it slip, you know, and that's all they needed. That's what they're looking for. It's not all bad. I'm going to share with you another retinal specialist in another retinal detachment case where I was opining. Hold on one second, Joe. Yeah. It's and at 9:33, it said, in this patient. Uh, is it necessary to record in the chart a reappointment date or okay to record reviewed cardinal signs of retinal detachment and be sure to call back if these occur? Well, if you're of the opinion you'd like to see them back again, and you know, six weeks is no magic number. Most of the time that I've seen it happen, it happens within a week or two. Um, you want to warn them signs and symptoms of retinal attachment, return, return ASAP if this occurs, but you, you should probably have in there a routine follow-up, four weeks, three weeks, two weeks, six weeks, whatever you feel comfortable with, because that's what most other providers will do. And you're going to be compared against what other most, what most other providers will do. As I always like to say, you know, when we were younger, our, our parents or our teachers always told us, somebody in our authority told us, would always say, just because everybody does it doesn't make it right. But it does make it the standard of care. If everybody does it, that's what the standard of care is. Now, this is actually a verbatim out of uh, another case. This was a deposition a retinal specialist who treated a patient who was allegedly misdiagnosed by an optometrist. The attorney asked, do you think that you as a medical doctor, as an ophthalmologist, are better trained and equipped to rule out or rule in a retinal attachment than an optometrist? Answer, I think optometrists are trained or suppose they're trained in their field to be able to do a dilated fundus exam to diagnose retinal tears or detachment as well as any other eye care professionals. 
attorney. Do you believe an optometrist has the same expertise and ability to diagnose a retinal attachment or retinal tear as you do? Answer, setting my ego aside, I said optometrists are trained to evaluate the peripheral retina as well as an ophthalmologist, and that's my answer. And these are the strategies they use. They pick at people's egos. They look. They work for their toward their insecurities. Now, I'll give an example. I was defending an optometrist who allegedly missed angle closure. They had a treating ophthalmologist involved who was opining. He said, "Yeah, the optometrist made an error in that he didn't uh, he didn't ask about theirs or didn't do this." But then again, you know, I might have made the same mistake, and I can kind of see how he would have done this and just like went over and over. And actually, his opinion saved the optometrist. Oh, another time, an optometrist was sued for uh, infectious keratitis. I was defending her. Uh, but the attorney wanted a corneal specialist involved. She was very friendly with a corneal specialist. She, she recommended him as, as an expert witness. He had never done it before. He was nervous out of his mind and ended up actually hurting her case. You know, sometimes it is black and white or worse. You know, here's a 55-year-old male who had a weed whacker abrasion. He actually was, was rebuilding his weed whacker. He starts it up in his garage and hits something on the floor. It ricochets back into his eye and hits him in the eye. Goes to an optometrist who diagnoses a corneal abrasion, treats him for a corneal abrasion, comes back two days later, sees the optometrist's partner, at this point has a shallow anterior chamber, pressure less than five, and a hypopia. And patient was then diagnosed with traumatic uveitis when clearly it was a self-sealing corneal perforation and an endophthalmitis. And the patient, after five retinal detachment surgeries, lost vision in that eye. But I can tell you in that situation, no less than seven people, expert witnesses and treating physicians, made a comment that yeah, you know, it was a, a a corneal perforation. It was there in central cornea. They didn't see it. They didn't diagnose it. And because they didn't diagnose it, they fell below the standard of care, and they were negligent. And that is the main. That those are the words they need. If they get the word negligent or below standard of care, the case is over. So I was asked to opine on this, and I didn't want to get involved in the case. I was asked to defend. And I didn't want to get involved in it. And the attorney talked me into it. And we actually came up with a strategy. The defense was they made a mistake. They made errors. They didn't treat the patient with malice. They didn't treat him with disrespect. They had diagnoses that were plausible. They followed the diagnoses to their conclusions. They were just the wrong diagnoses. And I can tell you that the attorney beat on me for about 20 minutes trying to get me to say negligent or below standard of care. When I didn't say that, he gave up. I don't know how it ended, but I was told everybody was very satisfied. And the defense was they made errors. They made, they made a diagnostic error. Sometimes it's best to admit it. But I can tell you, in that case... No less than seven professionals said in all medical problems, they missed it. Because they missed it, they fell below the standard of care. I can't tell you how many times I, I, I have heard the phrases in depositions, trials, in all medical probability, the retinal break, coil per rate, perf, whatever it was, was present at the time of your examination. Because you failed to see and diagnose it, you fell below the standard of care because the standard of care dictates that you would have seen and diagnosed it. And because you didn't diagnose it and see it, you were negligent. Is that true? Is that correct? What do you think of that, guys? This is what I think of it. It is crap. That is not standard of care. Here is what would be read to a jury prior to deliberation in medical malpractice, standard of care and negligence. Negligence is a person's failure to follow a duty of conduct composed by law. Every provider is under a duty to use their best judgment in the treatment and care of the patient, use reasonable care and diligence, the application of his or her knowledge and skill to patient care, 
and to provide health care in accordance with the standards of practice among members of the same health care profession with similar training experience in the same or similar communities at the same time the health care is rendered. The law does not require provider absolute accuracy in their practice or judgment, does not hold you to a standard of infallibility or require you to have the utmost degree of skill and learning known only to a few in the profession, only that you use the same standards of practice exercised by members of the same profession with similar training and experience situated in the same or similar communities at the same time the health care is rendered. A provider does not ordinarily guarantee the correctness of their diagnosis, analysis, judgment, or outcome. And absent such a guarantee, a provider is not responsible for a mistake in their diagnosis, analysis, judgment, unless he, is vi or he or she has violated the duty previously described. Now, if a patient comes in with flashes and floaters and vision reduction, and you don't dilate. Like that, that is hard to that you cannot support that because most practitioners would dilate or look or refer. Never make a late amendment to a chart. Is that fact or fiction? We can do that as a quick polling question, Greg. What do you think, guys? Never make a late amendment. Is that fact or fiction? And Joe, as it's rolling in. Uh, I'm just going to make a comment to just kind of the standard of care, like when it comes to like, um, like treating a, a, a keratitis, a, you know, a, a, an infectious keratitis. Um, you know, we use a fourth generation fluoroquinolone and they're only approved for conjunctivitis. So now we're going off label, but, you know, nine out of 10, three out of four, whatever the ratio you want to see, corneal specialists will use that. So it's okay that you're going off label. Same thing, like I do a herpes lecture and talk about Valtrex. Well, Valtrex is only approved for genital herpes. Why are we using it for simplex? Why are we using it for um, using it for zoster when it's genital herpes? Well, it's because it's the standard of care that's out there. So, I mean, I think this is a good, I would think it was a great definition of what you use there to help us feel comfortable because I get it all the time. Like, oh, you're using that drug off label. Well, yeah, that's because it's the standard of care. Exactly. You know, like you know, like 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 mom told us, you know, just because Harry does it doesn't mean it's right, but it does make it the standard of care. <laughs> so everybody is looking at it and it's kind of split. That's fact. You don't want to make a, a late amendment. I mean, there there are amendments that you can do, but you don't you don't want to uh you want to be transparent. This is an example of one that I had, and I actually wrote, uh, I reviewed this chart and amended on this date at this time in full knowledge, the original note was given to the patient on this date, so they can obtain necessary referrals and care. I acknowledge there'll be some differences in the wording of the chart compared to that given to the patient due to the urgent nature and the patient needing this document. If you're going to do it, you can add things, but make sure it's transparent when you did it and why you did it. Because virtually anything can be defended except the appearance of dishonesty. I'm not going to go into that. That is a fact. I'm going to wrap up with a couple little quick cases here. The case of Tobidex, Tobidex, Tobidex. Patient was, was diagnosed with infectious keratitis. And diagnosis was good. The optometrist prescribed Tobrex and gadafloxacin. I, I, I have no, I have no issues with this now. They still, if there's a, this is a practice with, with an, o, an OD and an MD. Now, in this practice at the time, they still were using paper charts, but they had just started e-prescribing. And the, the system was the doctor would write the notes and the technician would e-prescribe for the doctors. Now, technician goes to e-prescribe. Tobrex is not in the system. Maybe, maybe he, you know, he, uh, he mistyped something. Tobrex doesn't come up, but Tobrex does come up. Thinks it's the same thing, doesn't verify, prescribes it, never asks the doctor. And, you know, 19 times out of 20, you're going to get away with this if you're dealing with blepharitis or conjunctivitis, but the patient had a fungal keratitis. Now, 
after that, the ophthalmologist took over. The ophthalmologist correctly looked at it and said, this could be a fungus, puts the patient on an antifungal, not realizing the patient is on Tobradex instead of Tobrex. Now, on each follow-up visit, the technicians you know, who, who are doing the intake did a very good job at writing down the patient was, was using Tobradex, 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 but they thought the doctors thought the patient was on Tobrex. It wasn't until 44 days later when the, when the globe perforated, they discovered the, uh, the issue. Now, the patient ultimately ended up with a, with a, fun, with a fungal uh, endophthalmitis and was referred to a retinal specialist. The retinal specialist uh, also got faxed records from the ODMD practice for continuity of care. Ultimately, a lawsuit was filed. When the records were produced, the ophthalmologist had rewritten all of the records and changed where it was written Tobradex to Tobrex. And what happens is you always get caught. So they, they were subpoenaed the records, they sent the records, but the retinal specialist, his records were, were subpoenaed as well. And within his chart was the original facts from the optometrist ophthalmologist uh, office, and they were not matching. So clearly he had changed. And had this been reported to the Board of Medicine, he would have lost his license. So never make a late amendment. And I'm not going to do this as a, as a polling question. We're going to skip over this one for the sake of time. We're, we're going to land this one. If the diagnosis is never correct, they can't sue for malpractice. So it's not, that's not really true. Can it be malpractice if the diagnosis is wrong? The answer is unfortunately yes. 37 year old female is asked to opine to defend the optometrist. Oh, Greg, while, while I'm going through this one, anybody out there, if you ever run afoul of a situation where you, you're, you're, you're being sued, you, you're, you're having problems, Greg, if you want to put my, my phone number, my cell phone into the chat room, give me a call. I'll talk you out the ledge. I've done it many times before. So, Anything happens, give me a call. Greg will put my, my cell in the uh, in the in the chat room. Our cell phone numbers are the worst kept secrets in all of eye care. You have a trouble, you get nervous, anything goes wrong, just ask. I'll talk you off the ledge. I've done it many times. 37-year-old female has pterygium surgery is giving Pred Forte postoperatively. What happened was referred from an optometry practice to an ophthalmology office. They did they did it. They saw the patient one day post up, everything is good. One the week post up, everything is good. Sends it back to the referring optometrist. Patient comes in three weeks later, post operatively, has some blurred vision, kind of vague. Uh, he doesn't check the pressure, doesn't really find any reason for her symptoms. Patient still has symptoms of, of blurred vision. Uh, comes back to see another optometrist the next day as an emergency. She says, just get the patient and get, get the patient dilated so I can take a quick look. So a patient is immediately dilated. She sees a swollen optic nerve, gets very, very nervous, cannot get the patient to a neurologist or neuro-ophthalmologist. She also doesn't check the pressure that day. But she does get a friendly retinal specialist who agrees to see the patient for her. So the patient goes over there, already dilated. He sees the same swollen nerve. He diagnoses optic neuritis. Yep. Now, he also measures the pressure. The pressure is 49.5, not 49, not 50, 49.5. He, died, he orders an MRI because he believes the patient has optic neuritis because of her age. He also diagnoses a steroid-induced pressure rise from the post-operative Pred Forte. And he does what any sane and reasonable person would do. He injects a steroid into the eye to treat her optic neuritis, which is not the right treatment. He doesn't address her pressure. And the MRI comes back as normal because she doesn't have optic neuritis. She had a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. How do I know? I did a five-page dissertation on it. I had the fields. I had the photos. And that's what she had. Both the optometrists and the ophthalmologists were sued for missing steroid-induced glaucoma. Greg, 
Does any glaucoma cause a swollen optic nerve, in your opinion? None that I'm aware of. <laughs> now, their plaintiff expert was an ophthalmologist because there was an ophthalmologist involved. And in his deposition, he opined any delay in treatment was significant because the glaucoma progression occurred at an unusually rapid rate and any delay by even an hour contributed to the bad outcome. Greg, does any glaucoma move by the hour? <laughs> uh, uh, nope. Yeah. The only other thing I know about glau uh, glaucoma would be glaucoma of the brain would cause yeah. uh, swelling of the nerve, not <laughs> ocular he, glaucoma. <laughs> he also said disc pallor is common in glaucoma. Is it? No. No. Glaucoma happens commonly with small cups. Yeah, ocular hypertension <laughs> taught us that well, right? <laughs> the when ocular the hypertension IOP, treatment study. <laughs> when ahead. the IOP is very elevated, it often causes a swollen nerve. Greg, can you agree with anything there? Uh, nope. No. And you never consider ischemic optic neuropathy in a patient under the age of 70. I'll be honest with you, Greg. I actually, I actually requested uh, a copy of this doctor's CV because I want to make sure he actually went to medical school. I have my <laughs> doubts. Greg, I have more to cover, but our time is at an end, so I'm going to call it there. That is it. I'm going to wrap it over. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to you, Greg. Thank you, Joe. Let me see if I can get the sharing here. And... And just thank everyone for uh, for being here. Questions were were taken during the uh, during the webinar, Joe. I want to thank you uh, for kind of changing it up, right? Uh, taking that little bit of a twist of misdiagnosis and malfeasance, turning it into some actual cases. Uh, I found it very enjoyable, and I think uh, the audience uh, most likely found it enjoyable. We'll see what the survey says, but I think you're going to get a nice big virtual round of applause for kind of taking something that we all think about and turning it into some case study. So great job. Thank you, Dad.